Money has always played a key role in American politics, but is it now distorting the democratic process? That's the charge made against Charles and David Koch, two secretive businessmen who have been bankrolling opposition to Barack Obama. With a year to go to the next presidential election, could the Koch brothers' $50 billion fortune put the radical right into the White House? In the American West, Colorado's Rocky Mountains are famous for first-class skiing. But last June, dozens of the richest people in America traveled to Vail for a different reason, to attend a secret meeting at this luxury hotel located in an exclusive community. I'm going to turn it over for a quick welcome uh, to Charles Coe. Charles, take it away. The invitation-only gathering of right-wing funders and activists was convened by Charles and David Koch, billionaire owners of Coke Industries, a privately held oil, chemical, paper, and financial services conglomerate with revenues of $100 billion a year. Attendees at Coke meetings, held twice a year, are sworn to secrecy, but undercover recordings were leaked to a blog. What I want to do is recognize not all of our great partners, but those partners who have given more than a million over the last 12 months. The Kochs and their partners spent at least $40 million in the 2010 U.S. elections, helping to shift the balance of power in the House of Representatives towards right-wing Tea Party Republicans. In Colorado, Charles Koch urged wealthy conservatives to dig deep into their pockets for the 2012 fight against President Barack Obama. This is the mother of our wars we've got over the next 18 months. For the life or death of this country, they are radical libertarians, basically. They oppose big government. They think that the free market does better when it's unregulated. And the family's been pretty much in, in kind of complete opposition to everything that's been done in America in terms of progressivism since the New Deal. Jane Mayer, an award-winning reporter for The New Yorker magazine, wrote a groundbreaking expose of the Kochs in 2010. They will say that they are just simply purely interested in these p kinds of politics for philosophical kinds of reasons, but the politics they favor also help their business interests. David Koch ran for vice president on the libertarian ticket in 1980, opposing Ronald Reagan from the right. An editor who knows the Kochs told Mayor that when David lost, the brothers turned away from electoral politics and set out to build a top-to-bottom operation to shape public policy in America. I think they've been amazingly effective. I mean, they are also, of course, amazingly well-funded. I mean, they're so rich that their pockets are almost bottomless, and so they can keep pouring money into this whole process. It's been reported that to defeat President Barack Obama next year, the Kochs plan to raise and spend more than $200 million. You want to kick in a billion, believe me, we'll have a special seminar just for you. But the Kochs could easily write checks for more without anyone knowing due to loopholes in American law. It was very hard to figure out, in fact, impossible to figure out how much money they've spent on American politics. It was easily $100 million um, since 1980. Charles and David Koch and their foundations have spent untold millions promoting their conservative libertarian agenda for America. They've poured money into backing favorable political candidates, heavily funded right-wing groups and think tanks, and spent millions lobbying public officials. They've created a web of influence that stretches from state capitals all the way to Congress. For decades, the Kochs largely escaped scrutiny, but that began to change when Barack Obama was elected president and the conservative Tea Party movement took off. We're against socialism in America. We, want, we stand for the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. We want our freedom. The Koch brothers, in a way, gave birth to the Tea Party. Lee Fong works for the Center for American Progress, a liberal think tank in Washington, D.C. He has kept close tabs on Americans for Prosperity, a political operation founded and funded by the Kochs to generate grassroots support for conservative policies and candidates. If you look at the first major wave of Tea Party rallies, they were centrally organized through Americans for Prosperity. They organized dozens and dozens of miniature rallies all over the country, in some cases actually paying for speakers and, and buses to bring people in, and also having some 60 different staff members fan across the country, uh, organizing events, uh, creating publicity, and making sure that they were a success. 
Americans for Prosperity's President Tim Phillips also spearheaded a Hands Off My Health Care tour targeting Obama's first policy initiative. This Senate and this House that meet right back at the Capitol behind us are going to vote on whether or not your health care becomes run by the government. In the end, a health bill was passed, but Obama was severely weakened in the fight. Today, Americans for Prosperity, AFP, has 33 state chapters and claims to have close to 2 million members. Five years ago, my brother Charles and I uh, provided the funds to start uh, the Americans for Prosperity. And uh, it's beyond my wildest dreams how AFP has grown into this enormous uh, organization. At AFP's 2009 National Summit, the heads of the organization's state chapters boasted to David Koch of their support for the Tea Party movement. We helped organize huge tea parties all throughout the state. The largest tax day tea party in the nation on April 15th. Hey folks, we've, we've held 29 tea parties. And if you try to raise our taxes and trample on our liberties, we're either going to beat you or make your life miserable. Before I wrote about them, they consistently denied that they were involved in the Tea Party. Eventually it became impossible because you could just connect all the dots. I think we've helped, but these are individualistic, entrepreneurial folks. Before joining Americans for Prosperity, Tim Phillips ran a hard-nosed political consulting firm. Do you think the Tea Party would be as evolved as it is now if you hadn't provided the kind of support you did in terms of training, communications? I mean, you've really played a central role in helping to build that movement, don't you think? No one directs them, uh, they, but we're good friends and partners with them, you bet, and we try to help them in every way we can. Whose interests does Americans for Prosperity represent? Uh, the interest of any American who wants economic prosperity and freedom. What do you say to those who say, look, at Americans for Prosperity is representing the interests of the Cokes, the wealthy, corporations? In the healthcare fight, who are we fighting for? average folks who didn't want the government making health care decisions uh, for them. On issue after issue, when you look at the results of what the left wants, who's going to be hurt by their policies and who's going to be helped by our policies, uh, it's clear we're, we're fighting for the middle class and for people who uh, work for a living. Hundreds of thousands of middle and working class people across the American Midwest would say just the opposite. In Wisconsin, Americans for Prosperity played a key role this past spring in supporting Republican Governor Scott Walker's efforts to cut social spending and eliminate collective bargaining rights for public employees. We're not going to allow for one minute uh, the protesters to feel like they can drown out the voices of those millions of taxpayers all across the state of Wisconsin. The Cokes provided funds to help get Walker elected. Then when citizens marched on the state capitol and occupied it to protest his plan, Americans for Prosperity spent at least half a million dollars on an anti-union ad campaign. Who decides Wisconsin's future, voters or government unions? Governor Walker has the courage to do what's right for Wisconsin. Stand with Walker. Um, do you need a ride to the polls or anything? When Walker's anti-union bill passed, the unions and Democrats responded by trying to remove Republican legislators in a special recall election this past August. Middle school teacher Judy Gundry went out to canvas for votes to oust Walker's team. You know, he targeted predominantly female jobs, teachers, nurses. Is Wisconsin divided over two visions of government right now, do you think? Clearly, the radical Republican agenda that is sweeping the entire nation has definitely taken hold here in Wisconsin. But Wisconsin is a progressive state, and these progressive people woke up. The, you know, farmers, teachers, all public workers. My husband, who works in the private sector, marched because we realized, too, that unions set wages. States that are, have high um, um, to unions, there's, the wages are higher, and we all do better when we all do better. Middle class families and working families across the country need to start standing up to what we're seeing. Phil Neuenfeld is the Wisconsin president of the AFL-CIO, the largest union federation in the U.S. It spent millions of dollars in the recall to counter millions pouring into Wisconsin to back Republicans. And thank her for balancing the budget and reforming government. From Americans for Prosperity and other conservative groups. We are operating under full disclosure. We are saying where our money is coming from. We are saying what our money is spent on. And what I've been trying to do is challenge uh, the American public and the media 
to ask the same questions of Americans for prosperity. The employees unions and the teachers unions are two of the last bastions of serious strength on the progressive side of democratic politics. That's where the money is. And if you want to eviscerate the left in America, you go after those groups. When the recall vote came in, two Republicans lost their seats, but the unions and Democrats needed three. We're winning there. We've won there for the year. There's no doubt about that. Isn't what's going on in Wisconsin really about trying to destroy the political power of unions? Yeah, that's a silly comment. I mean, Bob, come on. It's about trying to bring economic prosperity back. And with regard to union rights, uh, with public employee unions, uh, they are simply receiving pensions and health benefits that are unfair and unjust. To go after unions over pensions, what about going after corporate executives who are now making, you know, uh, 300 times what an average worker was in the past? Uh, Americans. Uh, America has the the most progressive income tax system uh, in the world. See, you look at the percent. You look sorry, at the you look at inequality. Inequality in America right now. Here's what's is made the same as it was before the Great Depression. The top one percent is controlling 25 percent of the income and 40 percent of the wealth. Here in this country, we give you opportunity. We give you opportunity to fulfill your dreams, to go as far as they will take you. How much have you guys spent in Wisconsin to? support Walker and take on the unions there? Uh, a lot. Can you give me a number? Uh, look, we don't give numbers and, and go into details. Uh, I think that's proprietary information, uh, but it's substantial. Americans for Prosperity is also very active in another state that is critical in the 2012 presidential election. Ohio, whose Governor John Kasich passed a bill to weaken unions that is similar to Wisconsin's. In August, Ohio citizens protested the annual meeting of the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, at a New Orleans hotel. ALEC is another Koch-funded group that brings together corporate lobbyists and conservative legislators to draft model laws. It turns out the anti-union measures in both Wisconsin and Ohio reflect ALEC model legislation, which the organization tries to keep under wraps. But a few months ago, a whistleblower leaked more than 800 of Alex's sample bills to the Center for Media and Democracy. Lisa Graves is its executive director. There are bills that are obviously bills that are crafted and written by corporate lobbyists to advance their agenda. And yet what happens here through Alec is that these corporations are actually voting, voting, pre-approving these bills, then these legislators go along with this system, introduce these bills in the state houses, and don't tell the public at all that those bills were pre-approved, pre-voted on by corporations. Voter ID laws passed this year in Wisconsin and four other states that make it harder for minorities, students, and the elderly to vote were based on an ALEC bill. When you got this trove of model legislation, what surprised you most about it? It affected nearly every area of uh, individual rights. The bills affect health health care rights, the protection of the environment. Many of the bills that have been produced by ALEC reflect Coke DNA, what I call Coke DNA, uh, because it reflects this um, uh, free market fundamentalism. The Cokes received ALEC's Adam Smith Award and with their foundations have provided about $1 million to the organization along with a $500,000 loan when it was floundering. The reason I think Alec was such an ingenious idea is that a little money goes a long way in the states. You can really have influence in state legislatures with, by, by spending. It's, it's, it's a lot cheaper to buy than Congress is. Alec, like the Cokes, would rather avoid the press. We were denied media credentials for the New Orleans meeting, but went anyway to find out why sessions are closed to the public and to follow up on our request for an interview with a top lobbyist for Coke Industries, Mike Morgan, who sits on Alec's private enterprise board. Why can't you credential me? We're focused on domestic issues at this time. But you know, and many of your many of your corporations sir, operate around the world. I'm sorry, but I'm going to have why, to ask you to Why are your workshops, why are your workshop, why are your task force meetings closed to the press and the public? We will not be credentialing you at this time. I would like to please ask you to leave the premises. Could you please uh, ask Mr. Morgan to call me? I do not handle his press. He's on your private enterprise board. On the back of this form, it says that if you would like to have interviews with members of your organization, that you can request okay. through you. Credential press only, you are not credential. Please. We were escorted out and never heard from Coke Industries Mike Morgan. But we did succeed in discovering the curious workshops Alec offers state legislators. 
like this one, suggesting climate change due to increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere could be beneficial. Climate change policy debate, which would fundamentally reorder the way we make energy and the way we use energy, has a direct business interest to the Cokes. Uh, they, they do a lot with pipelines that move oil, they have refineries. Kurt Davies is the research director for Greenpeace, which has compiled the most comprehensive database on the Koch's political spending. Since 1998, we've tracked over $50 million that they have sent to various front groups and think tanks in Washington, around the country, who have run various elements of a campaign against global warming policy or against the science of global warming. So these institutions have done uh, reports and forums and put people in the media to uh, oppose the consensus view that, that climate change is real and urgent and we have to do something about it. The Koch's investment in conservative think tanks and academia is another key component of their integrated campaign to shape America's political policies. It says specifically that there is no basis in the scientific literature existing at this time for these claims of massive sea level rise. Patrick Michaels, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, often appears in the media to contest global warming science. This is a problem that's going to solve itself unless we do something silly. The Cato Institute, which was founded by Charles Koch, has received about $14 million from the Kochs. I think that society will address the emissions of carbon dioxide and the energy issues because of pressures for increased efficiency. Only one in three Americans sees global warming as a serious threat, a sharp drop since 2009, according to a Gallup poll. A critical turning point was ClimateGate, the controversy over emails hacked from scientists at a British university. A lot of what troubled me were the attempts to uh, hide things from Freedom of Information Acts. You've got to wonder what's being hidden. What pundits like Pat Michaels and institutions like Cato did they, they declared that this evidence, these emails, showed that scientists were lying about data or colluding to tell people a story that wasn't true. In fact, multiple institutions have exonerated the scientists. There was no wrongdoing, no uh, misinformation. Those investigations, none of them were truly independent. The polls have showed a pretty significant change in Americans' attitudes. To what extent do you think the whole ClimateGate fiasco contributed to that? Oh, I think the ClimateGate did. You said on national television that you received about 40% of your funding from fossil fuel companies. Is that right? Varies. Varies. It varies. It varies. Have you ever received any funding from the Cokes? No. Oh, well, oh, that's not true. I had a speaking fee somewhere way back in the Ice Age. So you've just been paid by, through institutions that have been funded by them? You're right. I stand, I stand, uh, I guess that's right, I have. Do you think it's just a coincidence that you are welcomed at an institution that promotes values that they are interested well, in? Well, if they, if they think that free markets are efficient uh, vehicles to create environmental protection, I think they're right. The Kochs have also promoted their free market ideology and business interests in Washington through aggressive lobbying on Capitol Hill and the funding of political candidates. The Kochs have spent upwards of $50 million since 2006 on lobbyists. The Kochs now are the largest funder of political campaigns within the oil and gas sector, exceeding Exxon, exceeding Chevron, all these other major players. In 2010, the Kochs contributed to 62 of the 87 new Republican members of the House of Representatives. The Kochs were so instrumental in the Republican takeover of the House that David Koch made a rare public appearance. Uh, I'm just asking, uh, what, what's, your what, what's your expecting from the new Congress? Uh, well, uh, cut the hell out of uh, spending and, uh, and uh, balance the budget and uh, reduce regulations and uh, support business. I was on Capitol Hill interviewing freshman members of Congress. As I'm walking around, I spotted David Koch. Out of all the people in the country, one of the first people into the new speaker's office was David Koch. Are you proud of what Americans for Prosperity has achieved this year? You bet election? I am. Man, oh man, we're going to do more too in the next couple of years. That same day, Koch Deputy Tim Phillips met with the new chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, Congressman Fred Upton, who oversees the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. At the end of the day, 
The EPA climate regime is all economic pain and no environmental gain. The Kochs were the largest oil and gas donor to members of Upton's committee, who have vigorously opposed efforts by Obama's EPA administrator, Lisa Jackson, to reduce global warming emissions. If it is true science, it should be provable, and that is what the argument is about. Congressmen backed by the Kochs have also made it difficult to get anything done on fiscal matters, strenuously opposing President Obama and even their own leadership. They have refused to raise taxes on corporations and the wealthy to help close the federal deficit. House Republicans have a plan to cut, cap, and balance our way to prosperity. The Republican position is they won't close a tax loophole that generates one penny for deficit reduction. Not one penny. The Koch strategy of block and defund everything, uh, of course, contributes to the job crisis. Some of the largest number of jobs lost in the last two years have been from the public sector. At the same time, when most economists are calling for a direct fiscal stimulus, uh, the Koch brothers and their deputies uh, and, and followers in Congress have completely uh, ignored that call and, and done the opposite. We've been from Florida to Montana. Americans uh, for Prosperity Ohio, is conducting a national tour blaming job losses and high gasoline prices resulting from the Obama administration's energy policies. But others blame speculators for those high gas prices, to which again the Koch brothers may have a connection. There's no doubt there's speculation in the oil markets. Nobody disputes that there is not only speculation, but the key word is excessive speculation. Michael Greenberger is a law professor and a former director of the Division of Trading and Markets at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission in Washington. When a consumer drives by a gas station and sees gas at four dollars or more a gallon, what do they need to understand about high gas prices today? I would say at least a dollar of that and probably more goes into the pockets of the speculators. Coke Industries has a financial arm that's one of the top oil traders in the world. But due to a lack of transparency in energy trading markets, only the company knows how much it speculates in oil. We wanted to ask Charles and David Koch about that, but they declined our request for an interview. However, these reports reveal that Coke Industries has been lobbying to shape commodity trading rules that were mandated by a 2010 financial reform bill. I'm almost certain they are not lobbying to make it stronger. Uh, they are part of a very large constituency that is trying to weaken all the regulatory gains we've made over the last few years to make these markets honest and fair, and especially fair to the American consumer and taxpayers. What do you say to the argument that the reason you're out here goes back to the fact that the Cokes are involved in speculation and that that's a way to divert attention from them. It's, a, it's an interesting argument. When you're losing on the issue, you resort to trying to go after uh, motive. They're going to win or lose based on the merits of these policies. And on the policies of economic freedom, we're right. And that's why we're winning. I think in the end, the country will wake up and see that the Cokes and people like them uh, don't have the interest of common people in mind. They have their own interests in mind. What do you expect to happen in 2012? My expectation is that uh, President Obama is outspent three or four to one. Some Democrats have said that President Obama will break all fundraising records and raise up to a billion dollars. But I think at the end it doesn't matter because the Koch brothers alone uh, increased their wealth by $11 billion in the last two years. Love ya. Conservative businessman Herman Cain, who has surged in the polls, has long-standing ties to Americans for Prosperity and Texas Governor Rick Perry attended the Koch secret meeting in Colorado. But so far, the Kochs have been silent about who they are backing for president in 2012. I pledge to all of you who, who step forward and are partnering with us that we are absolutely going to do our utmost to invest this money wisely and get the best possible payout for you in the future of our country.